Before we get into the video, I just want to give a quick disclaimer that some of the photos in this video are slightly older than the 1920s, mostly during World War I. But since that's only about two or three years before the 1920s started, things would have looked pretty much the same. And most of the photos don't include the year they were taken, so instead of guessing which ones are from the 1920s, I'll just include them all. I figured that if I didn't mention that here, there would be comments saying like, oh my god, World War I wasn't in the 1920s, how do you not know that, or something. Also, just a quick mention that the Lincoln Memorial was officially completed in 1922, and this magazine issue is from June 1923, so in these photos, it has just been opened or very close to it. Okay, I'm gonna shut up now and get to the photos. The Transformation of Washington National Geographic June 1923 The Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial from the air To the right are the temporary Navy Department and Munitions Buildings, located in Potomac Park during the World War, when 5,000 trees and shrubs were sacrificed to make a place for them. Every lover of Washington hopes that these factory-like structures will soon be removed, thereby restoring the beauty and symmetry of the mall, with its monumental structures. In the lower left corner is the old Bureau of Engraving and Printing Building, and immediately beyond is the north end of the Tidal Basin. In the background sweeps the Potomac. The small white building in front of the monument is the waiting room for those wishing to ascend the shaft by elevator. The Lincoln Memorial, on the axis of the Washington Monument and the Capitol. The Capitol, Washington Monument, and Lincoln Memorial are on the main axis of the central composition so arranged that each gives dignity to the others. Washington was planned in 1792 as a unified city. The plan was neglected from 1824 until 1901, when it was re-established and enlarged. Washington from the air, showing the White House, the National Geographic Society buildings and property, indicated by arrow, and surroundings. The white sectors in the foreground are a few of the many baseball diamonds which dot the mall, one of the many public recreation features of the city in the vicinity of the Washington Monument. Beyond these is the ellipse. In the middle distance is the White House and Lafayette Square, from which 16th Street runs north past the National Geographic Society headquarters. The general reading room of the Library of Congress. The rotunda is 100 feet in diameter, and at each of its eight angles rise clustered piers of red Numidian marble, resting on bases of brown Tennessee stone, and supporting semicircular arches that bear the massive entablatures, from which spring the ribs supporting a great dome of copper. In addition to its three million books, the library contains collections of prints, maps, manuscripts, music, and books for the blind. There are 102 miles of shelving in this, America's National Library, where two copies of every copyrighted book are deposited, the books catalogued, and the printed catalog cards distributed among the libraries of the country. Books needed in any part of the United States are furnished to institutions through their local libraries. There is an average of 3,000 visitors each day. A glimpse of the Capitol Dome through a window in the rotunda of the House of Representatives office building. Committees of the House of Representatives and individual members not accommodated in the Capitol have offices in this building, which is connected with the Capitol by a tunnel passageway, as is also the Senate office building. The Capitol, the Senate, and House offices, and the Library of Congress are on four sides of an open square. The Washington Post Office and Union Station These buildings, while related to the Capitol group, were made distinctly subordinate to the Capitol. The land between them and the Capitol has been condemned for use as Congress gardens and sites for public buildings, but only half of it has been paid for. Temporary war buildings, in the right foreground, occupy a portion of the unsightly area. The picture shows the crowds gathered to welcome General Pershing upon his return from France. Rambler Roses in the grounds of the Department of Agriculture Unveiling the South Dakota Stone in the Washington Monument Many who use the elevator to ascend the monument walk down its 898 steps to view the diverse memorial stones built into its walls. These include memorials from states, a bust of Shakespeare, a stone from a library of Egypt, inscriptions in Chinese and in Welsh, and some markers from societies all but forgotten. The South Portico of Memorial Continental Hall these 13 monolithic, fluted, ionic columns were the gifts respectively of the society chapters or the legislatures of the original 13 states. 
This building was loaned to the United States by the Daughters of the American Revolution for the sessions of the Conference on the Limitation of Armaments. In its auditorium are held the annual meetings of the DAR. Tree Boward New Hampshire Avenue north from DuPont Circle. Beautiful American elms, much as these, will be planted more profusely in the future in the capital. Washington already has the largest per capita street tree population of an American city. If its 105,889 street trees were planted at the customary interval on a northbound highway, the motorist would have a tree-shaded boulevard well beyond New York. This number, of course, does not include the thousands of trees in parks, squares, circles, and gardens. Georgetown University and its astronomical observatory seen from the Virginia banks of the Potomac. Established upon its noble promontory before the federal government came to Washington, this venerable institution harbors historic memories which span the years from Lafayette's visit there to that of Marshall Foch. The two tiny buildings to the west of the Astronomical Observatory house instruments of Georgetown's Seismological Observatory, where earthquakes as far away as the Antipodes have been recorded. Frequently, the news of such a disturbance is reported from here far in advance of its exact location by cable dispatches. A tribute to the nation's heroic dead in the amphitheater of the Arlington National Cemetery. The President of the United States is seen delivering his address on the occasion of the burial of the unknown soldier on Armistice Day, 1921. The Cavalry Group of the Monument to General Ulysses S. Grant. This is the most important work of sculpture ever designed for the government, and was located so as to be the head of the mall. From it, a broad carpet of grass extending to the Washington Monument will be flanked on each side by four rows of American elms, and by drives and walks, thereby restoring the park connections between the Capitol and the White House. Special artillery and cavalry drills were given at West Point and at other posts to aid the sculptor, Henry Merwin Shady, in the development of his design. Mr. Shady spent nearly 15 years upon the sculptures, and died in New York just two weeks prior to the unveiling of the monument, on the centenary of Grant's birth, April 27, 1922. The unfinished cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul at night. The recently completed apse of the cathedral lifts its delicate beauty upon the summit of Mount St. Alban, overlooking the national capital from the northwest. The Commission of Fine Arts Vision of the Washington of Tomorrow. Much has been done during the 21 years since the enlarged plan for the development of Washington was reported to Congress. Quite as much is underway, and still more is obviously necessary to be done in order to accomplish the ideals of Washington and Jefferson. The illustration shows proposed public buildings facing the mall from the edge of the reflecting basin in front of the Lincoln Memorial to the Capitol. The Monument and the Lincoln Memorial at the time that this airplane photograph was made, the reflecting basin between the lofty shaft and the temple had not been completed. It now mirrors the majesty and beauty of both noble edifices. The Lincoln Memorial The proportions of the memorial are so fine that its great mass and height and length and breadth are suppressed in its unity. Among the columns of the Lincoln Memorial Surrounding the walls of the memorial is a colonnade forming a symbol of the Union, each column representing a state, 36 in all, one for each state existing at the time of Lincoln's death. The columns are 44 feet high and 7 feet 5 inches in diameter at their base. On the walls appearing above the colonnade and supported at intervals by eagles are 48 memorial festoons, one for each state existing today. A seaplane alights on the memorial reflecting basin. In winter, when the shallow water freezes, the basin is an ideal rendezvous for skaters. The Lincoln Statue Standing before the colossal figure in the memorial building, while assistants put the finishing touches to the statue on the day before the dedication, are Henry Bacon, the architect, and Daniel Chester French, the sculptor. Mr. French is nearer the latter. Age canopied by a herald of spring in one of Washington's city parks. The white blossoms of an oriental magnolia appear before the first buds of the surrounding trees in Franklin Square begin to open. Its conspicuous flowers are a place of pilgrimage for those who welcome the passing of winter frosts. Alright, so that's all for part one. There are actually quite a few photos of Washington, D.C. in this issue of National Geographic, so I thought I would split them up into multiple parts so that they're more easily digestible. 
Personally, I think the photos get more interesting as they go along, so please stay tuned for the next installment. Well, that's all for now, all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age.